Hello everyone, I'm recording this on Wednesday, September 14th, 2022. It has been almost a week since the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. I just watched her travel from Buckingham Palace for the last time down the mall to Westminster. Um... I didn't want to record anything before because emotions were everywhere. It was crazy. I think I've had every emotion a person can have in the last week. And I'm glad that I took the time to just absorb it all. See how things have kind of panned out before coming on here and talking about it. When I was trying to organize my thoughts, it was um it was Tuesday, yesterday. It was exactly one week since we saw the final photos of Queen Elizabeth still alive as she was performing one of her most important constitutional duties of accepting the resignation of Boris Johnson as prime minister and swearing in Liz Truss as his replacement. He'd had previous engagements that week that she had had to cancel for health reasons. She was looking really tiny, really frail, but she's 96. (laughs) And everybody was kind of worried about this curious bruise she had on her hand, but again... Um, I was trying to ignore that because she's 96. Something that did help in making me feel better about her appearance was the biggest smile. I mean, she was adorable and her eyes truly did sparkle. Everybody mentioned it, but you could see it in the picture. And then two days later... While I was preparing to record a couple of episodes, um, got a message to check the news, and the news was that she was gravely ill, and the entire royal family was racing to get to her. I instantly became glued to live coverage of the event. Even if I wasn't doing this podcast, even if I didn't have my Twitter account where I've been very, very active lately, um, I still would have been glued to this because this is not only a really sad moment full of anxiety, but I knew it could quite possibly be one of the biggest historical moments that I ever lived through. Right away, um, information was changing all the time. We knew that Prince Charles and Princess Anne were up at Balmoral with the Queen. We assumed at the time that they were there when she passed. Prince William, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, and Sophie were They all showed up pretty quickly, but from what I hear, they didn't quite make it on time. And we heard Harry and Meghan were coming, and then later that changed to just Harry coming. And then people, obviously, with Meghan, everything gets crazy because (sighs) I think we know why. But people are trying to say that she wasn't invited because of current issues in the news. But I think it was pretty obvious that, you know, if Kate can't be there because she's watching the kids, it would look real bad if Megan showed up. But Harry did end up showing up after it had been announced to the entire world that his grandmother had died. And the pictures of him in the car as he's pulling into Balmoral 
he just looked absolutely shattered. So there was that period of about six hours where things were just going from bad to worse. And I know that I was just trying to express all my feelings through Twitter and just let it out there because I don't have anybody in real life that I can just like freak out with over things like this. I'm just the kind of person that will try to pretend something bad is not about to happen even though everything says it's about to happen because I just don't want to put that kind of energy out into the universe and then I feel like I contributed to it happening. I know it doesn't make any sense but that's just how I do it, okay? That's just how I deal. I knew it was bad when the family was rushing there and we were literally tracking planes to see where they were going and how they got there and when they got there. And then BBC goes black so they can all change into black. You know, that's uh, not a good sign. And then about an hour before she was pronounced dead, there was a double rainbow over Buckingham Palace that I honestly in my heart of hearts, felt like, yeah, that's it. (laughs) They haven't announced it yet. But that double rainbow just told me everything. (laughs) The news said they were coming back at 6. They came back around 6.30 and officially announced it. Afterwards, there was an immediate announcement that Charles is the new king. Um, it took a few minutes to figure out what he chose as his regnal name. He had chosen to keep his name like his mother had and become King Charles III, which I'm pretty sure you all know by now. But the announcement of King Charles III and people at Buckingham Palace starting to sing God Save the King was the beginning of what I have internally called the first emotional ping pong game, where on the one hand, you are mourning the loss of possibly one of the most cherished and well-known people in the entire world. And you are also supposed to be congratulating her grieving son for becoming her replacement. The next day, King Charles is brought down to London and has to address the nation and the world as king. I watched his car drive from the airport to Buckingham Palace. I watched him greet people for the first time as king and check out the flowers that people had brought in memory of his mother as he was being driven there, you just watched him drive past all of these billboards with his mother's face on them and people that had stopped to watch him go by. And I can't, I can't even imagine trying to deal with all this. In his address, which was most likely pre-written with some minimal edits, he gave Prince William, uh, the Prince of Wales title, which was quicker than I thought it was going to be, which is tradition. Just right before this was all going down, I had noticed that some people in Wales were rather politely asking that maybe we, we rethink that one. Maybe we don't need a Prince of Wales anymore because if you know the history and why it's an English prince that is the Prince of Wales, it's really to keep the Welsh in their place. The best example of somebody politely asking that we not do this anymore is a video of Michael Sheen and I think I'm just gonna insert a little clip of him talking because A, I love his voice. B, it's It's better than what I could say, honestly. You know, obviously, um, 
we're getting close to a time where there's going to be a sort of changing of the guard in the royal family. You know, the queen, who I, uh, you know, I've done a film about her. You have. <laughs> and and I think she's a, a remarkable person who's, mm -hmm. who's, you know, done exemplary service to to the country. Um, and and you know, sadly, she won't be with us for for, for much longer, I guess. Um, and when that changes and the requirements of traditional requirements would mean that the Prince of Wales would become a, a new uh, person uh, and a new Englishman. It would be, uh, I think, a, 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 a really uh, meaningful and powerful gesture, let's say, for um, th that title uh, to no longer be held uh, in the same way as it has before. That would be an incredibly meaningful thing, I think, to happen. Um, and I, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm asking for no more or less than just uh, uh, make a break there. Put some things that have been wrongs of the past right. There's an opportunity to do that at that point. Um, uh, don't necessarily just because of habit and without thinking just carry on that tradition or, or, that was started as a humiliation to our country. That's what it was. It was a humiliation. Um, you rose up, you tried to do this, you are going to do it. I will now make always the son of the monarch uh, uh, be the Prince of Wales. And that is a reminder of a humiliation. Why not change that as we come up to this moment where, where things inevitably will change anyway? Speaking of his children, he did not address his thoughts on Harry and Meghan by calling them the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Some people have taken this to possibly be that those titles might be going away. He did say that Harry and Meghan are building a new life in America. So that doesn't really sound like there's any sort of reconciliation or them coming back into the fold. I don't know why anybody thinks that's going to happen. It really doesn't look like it, guys. <laughs> On Saturday, the 10th, there was the, uh, the accession council met to formalize Charles as the new king. Flags, which had been half mass for the passing of the queen, were all returned to full mass for 24 hours. And congratulations for the new king, which again, back and forth, ping pong. While Charles and Camilla are being sworn in as the new king and queen, back up at Balmoral, a large portion of the royal family were seen outside for the first time since her passing to check out the floral tributes left in memory of the queen. And then later that day, surprise to everybody, the ex-Fab Ford went on walkabout, I believe, outside of Windsor Castle. That's where they're all staying. There is some discussion on whether... It was Charles who decided that they should do that, or if William texted his brother and said we should all four go out there and just see the people. There were also some rumors going around that the reason that Meghan and Harry were asked to do the walkabout with William and Catherine was because um, there were talks that Harry and Meghan were planning on doing their own walkabout with an American TV station. And I'm really hoping it's not true. But I just thought I would put that out there because I heard it quite a lot. And I do like to sometimes acknowledge rumors and conspiracies. I don't believe in them. I don't believe in a lot of things, especially if... My source is some unknown royal expert or a palace source. I just, I don't, if no one's going to put their name on the line, if no one was there to hear it, if it's not the person who actually was involved in the problem, I don't believe it. 
But I will hold on to that information for later. Because if something similar comes up again, I'm going to be like, aha! On Sunday, which is the 11th, the queen was finally moved from Balmoral. She'd been in the ballroom, um, allowing the staff to say their goodbyes. They were then putting her in a hearse to drive her from Balmoral all the way to Edinburgh, um, to the palace of Holyrood House with Princess Anne in a car behind her for the six-hour drive. I've been really impressed with Princess Anne. I mean, obviously, I'm always impressed with Princess Anne. (laughs) She's an impressive lady, but she's escorted her mother every step of the way, and she will all the way to the end. As soon as the cars came through the gate, and you saw like the front of the hearse with the cars behind it, and it looked like when they came through, you were just going to see a bunch of black cars, but when the hearse took the turn onto the road and you could see through the hearse and see the coffin and that bright yellow of the royal standard that was the first time it hit i think everybody else can agree that grief no matter who you're grieving over it kind of comes in waves and that was one that was one of the biggest ones While the Queen's coffin was being driven to Holyrood House back in London, the King met up with the Commonwealth High Commissioners in the Bow Room at Buckingham Palace. On Monday the 12th, the King and Queen went to Westminster Hall to meet up with the Houses of Commons and Lords to receive condolences before they flew up to Edinburgh. Once there, the king attends the Ceremony of the Keys, a service of prayer at St. Giles, and an audience with the Scottish Parliament. There's a procession down the Royal Mile to St. Giles Cathedral with the coffin from Holyrood House. The queen is left there for 24 hours to lie in state so the public can say goodbye to her. At around 7.20 in the evening, all four of the Queen's children come back to hold a vigil over the coffin. And Anne, of course, is there. And she's the first female to ever take part in the vigil of the princes. On Tuesday the 13th, Charles and Camilla fly to Belfast in Northern Ireland to meet the Secretary of State and party leaders. Uh, They traveled to St. Anne's Cathedral for prayer before flying back to London so they can greet the Queen's coffin at Buckingham Palace. And that was last night. So, last night, Princess Anne and the Queen's coffin were greeted by the entire royal family at Buckingham Palace. The Queen stayed in the bow room. And the whole family apparently had dinner and just private time to grieve together. And then this morning, as I said at the beginning of this podcast, just about an hour ago, she was taken in procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. There was a small service, and now she is to lie in state for the next four days. Hundreds of thousands of people are in queue, as British people really love to do. And people will shuffle by and get to say goodbye to their queen. So that was a lot to recap. Definitely wasn't everything that this family has been through. And I phrase it that way because yesterday there's a clip of, I almost called him Prince Charles, of King Charles trying to sign his name and a pen starts leaking and he just like I mean he didn't lose his shit as much as I would have at this point but he just like got up and walked off 
and Camilla kind of like calmly came in and got a new pen and signed her name and (laughs) I totally get it not only is he like an older man who has to go through all of this all these ceremonies because he's the new king and he has to see all the people and he has to sign all the documents but also his mother just died and while on the one hand it's probably nice to be really busy so you don't really have the time to grieve it's all pent up in there and that's going to be a lot to deal with and honestly watching them especially I felt like when they came out of Balmoral and you see it all over Sophie's face, the Countess of Wessex. She looks distraught and tired, and you feel so bad for them. And I don't like really watching them grieve in public, but like that's what they do. They live their lives in public. In the gilded cage, I think they call it. And not only is there an emotional ping pong game on the one hand, where you're going back and forth between grieving and congratulating, but with my other hand, I'm playing an emotional game of ping pong with people who don't like the monarchy and can't find a way to express themselves that doesn't personally attack people who are grieving right now. So while I'm offended that there are millions of people grieving a woman for multiple reasons, you're just insulting them for grieving. And I just want anybody who's listening to this episode to know that you're allowed to grieve. You're allowed to feel sad about this, and you're allowed to not know why you do. You're also allowed to grieve this woman and also, kind of like myself, agree with what some of these people are saying. I might not have such violent feelings about it, but I do feel like there are things that probably need to change. I know that this monarchy has been evolving over time, and that's why I have a podcast called Modern Monarchy, but some stuff does need to change, and I think one of them I've already mentioned, the title of Prince of Wales, nobody even asked if the Welsh wanted to have that still. Like, you claim to love Wales, you claim that you want to help the Welsh people, but for this small thing, you don't even care to ask them you just went along with tradition and I don't want to go into all the things that could change to make it better I think I'm going to save that for a later podcast because right now it's just in the fucking middle of dealing with all of the changes that the UK is going through with a change in prime minister and the change of a monarch which they haven't had to do in 70 years. I understand that some people feel like we didn't have time to wait and talk about changes because King Charles comes in immediately. King Charles comes in and addresses the country and gives away a title immediately. Like, there is nobody got time for those changes. I also know that, like myself... That this is not the only thing that everyone is dealing with in their own lives. I know for me this is not the only death that I have cried over in the last week. One of the most triggering things for me is that the death of the queen really reminds me of the death of my own grandmother. Which just happened last October. And it's similar in the way of they were a similar type of woman like my grandmother the queen was also a very thoughtful and lovely person and she was also a very pragmatic person and didn't want anyone to fuss over her also just like the death of my grandmother we knew it was coming 
We didn't know when, but we knew it was coming very soon to the point that when I visited her, I knew it was going to be the last time I ever saw her. I don't know if this will help anybody, but I just thought I would share this. If you're someone like me who is dealing with this and you kind of feel alone, I, I mean, I, I do have one person that I've been confiding in. Luckily, like if I didn't have him, it just kind of feels like a majority of the people around me are anti-monarchy and very aggressive about it. So I don't really have many people to talk to. There's a Twitter account for the Diana Award. Um, it's an award that was established in memory of Diana, the Princess of Wales. I think you've heard of her. It is the most prestigious accolade a young person aged 9 to 25 years can receive for their social action or humanitarian work. They offered up a service um, that I saw via a tweet that says, If you feel overwhelmed during this period of national mourning and you don't feel comfortable speaking to someone you know, don't worry, we've got you. Our messenger service provides free confidential support 24-7. Just text DA, like for Diana Award. Um, to 85258 any time, day or night. I haven't used the service, but it's worth a shot if you really are struggling and you don't have anybody to talk to. While the grief does come in waves, she didn't make appearances all the time, and so it takes you a little while to notice the absence. Like Prince William said in his official statement on the passing of his grandmother, I knew this day would come, but it'll be some time before the reality of life without Granny will truly feel real. Hashtag same, William. Hashtag same. But for now, this is a good time to rest while the chaos has calmed down a bit. Um, on Friday the 16th, the king will visit Wales on his UK tour. And on Monday the 19th, the queen's funeral will take place at Westminster Abbey before the queen's coffin makes its final travel via procession to Wellington Arch and then to Windsor Castle, where she'll be lowered into the royal vault. There will be a private burial service for senior members of the royal family, and her final resting place will be the King George VI Memorial Chapel at St. George's Chapel in Windsor, where she will be reunited with her parents, her sister, and her Prince Philip. And while I decided to take a few days before making this podcast so that I wouldn't be an emotional mess. I still have somehow made myself cry. <laughs> Good job, me. Um, I will do a podcast next week. Probably a couple of days after the funeral. And just kind of finish the coverage on that. But for now, I'm going to go. If you listen to this podcast and you end up going to see the queen while she lies in state, please let me know on Twitter. I know you can't take pictures, but I just want to know what's it like and how long did you wait in line? Find me on Twitter at underscore modern monarchy or on Instagram at modern monarchy podcast. No matter where you find me on the internet, you should be able to find a link tree if you want to find me somewhere else. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.